Hello, everyone. This is Seth Bloom. I'm the uh, Senior um, Director of Attorney Services at Level Set, and I'm happy to be with you today and have another great webinar scheduled for us. Uh, today, we have Reese Henderson, who will be speaking from Jacksonville, Florida. He's a partner at Gray Robinson, and they practice uh, all over the state of Florida, including some parts of Georgia. So, Reese, I'll turn it over to you, and I look forward to you uh, having a great uh, webinar today. Thank, thanks, uh, Seth. I appreciate that. And uh, good afternoon, everybody, since it's now noon. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen so that you guys can see the, um, see the, the presentation. As uh, Seth said, uh, I'm a construction attorney here in Jacksonville. Uh, I've been board certified uh, since uh, 2006 in construction law. And uh, I'm part of a firm, Gray Robinson. We have offices throughout the state of Florida. And uh, I'm also admitted in Georgia. I'm very familiar with filing uh, claims of lien and litigating those claims of lien in Florida and also in Georgia. And so uh, there's some nuances. And in, in today's seminar is not about Georgia law. Uh, but, um, you know, today's seminar is also not a basic lien law seminar that we will cover some of the basics just so that you have some context for when I get into the problems with uh, perfecting your lien rights, given the COVID-19 uh, situation that everybody's dealing with. And of course, because of COVID-19, you're seeing me from my home office. Uh, this isn't the office I'm normally working out of. So um, that's why if the lighting is a little off, uh, you know, I, I apologize. But uh, so what we're going to cover today is... Um, you know, as, as you probably, anybody who's ever had to file a lien in any state knows there, there are strict time deadlines that apply. And that's also true in Florida. And, uh, but because of the closures of some offices in Florida because of the, the pandemic and because of the, the stay at home orders that have been issued and uh, several of the clerk's offices throughout the state have uh, actually closed. So that creates some unique challenges. Uh, so we're gonna talk about that a little bit. And, uh, and what you can do to go ahead and get your liens recorded, notwithstanding that, um, because that uh, if you don't get your lien recorded timely, then you quickly lose your lien rights. And in Florida, as in many other states, your lien rights are your best avenue for recovery, because at the end of the day, if you are a subcontractor or you're a material supplier and you're looking to your customer to pay, many times they don't have the wherewithal to pay if they're not paid by their customer. So, uh, your lien puts you in line to get paid directly by the owner, and that, that's the position that you want to be in because nine times out of ten, it's the owner who has the money. So, um, so we'll, we'll do uh, just some basic overview of Florida construction uh, lien law uh, and, and just so that you have some context for the different deadlines that apply and, and, and the actions you have to take. So we're, we're going to cover who can lien, what you can lien for, uh, what notices are required to perfect your lien rights, and then finally, when can you file your lien? So let's cover some of those basics with, uh, first of all, who can lien? Well, a general contractor that, or that, in fact, anybody who has a direct contract with the owner uh, has the right to file a lien under Chapter 713 of the Florida statute. So a uh, licensed general contractor, it could also be a material supplier if the owner buys materials direct which sometimes happens on projects. The owner wants to save the contractor's markup on tile, for example, so they'll buy the tile directly from the tile distributor. So if that's the case and uh, the distributor uh, delivers the tile on credit and the owner doesn't pay, then, then the, the tile distributor can have a, a lien uh, as a direct privity uh, lien or with the owner. Uh, next in line are subcontractors. These are people who don't have a direct contract with the owner, but are, have a contract with the general contractor who has a contract with the owner. Below that tier, you have sub-subcontractors. And then uh, below that tier, you have a material or equipment supplier to any of any of the other parties at any tier. So what this means in, in, in very uh, simple terms is that if you are a sub-sub-subcontractor, you do not have lien rights in Florida. If you're a material supplier to a sub-sub-subcontractor, you do not have lien rights in Florida. The, the material person to the subcontractor is, is as far down as it goes. So um, you need to, if you're thinking about filing a lien, you need to look at how many tiers are between you and the owner, because depending on what tier you are, you may or may not have lien rights. So that covers the waterfront of who has lien rights. Now, what can you lien for in Florida? The, the key standard is that it has to be labor services or materials that are actually incorporated into the, into the project. Now, there are exceptions for some specially fabricated materials and things of that nature and, and for materials that are stored 
uh, that, uh, you know, and that sort of thing. But, uh, but by and large, you're talking about materials that have actually been incorporated into the project. So uh, you can incorporate for those labor services and materials. You can, you can lean for uh, equipment rental. If you're an equipment rental company, you can lean for construction management. If you're overseeing the construction and you're in your uh, daily obser observing uh, the work that's ongoing, that, that is a leanable service. Now, what can you not lean for? Again, this is just a very quick overview, but one of the common things that we do see problems with are people wanting to lean for things like delay damages or lost profits. That is not something, uh, delay damages are, are not for an improvement to real property. They do not improve the, it's not, it's not services that you provided that improve the property. Uh, it's simply damages that, that are out of your pocket. That, that's not something you can lean for. So uh, before I continue, uh, uh, I want to stop there and just give Seth an opportunity is, uh, to see if we have any questions so far. We don't have any questions so far, but uh, it's a good point to stop right now and ask and encourage people if they do have any questions while you have Reese here. Uh, fine Florida attorney, board certified in construction. Uh, maybe Reese, the one thing I was thinking of is, you know, as I work with construction lawyers all across the country, um, you do have board certification in um, Florida and you don't necessarily have to have it to practice construction law. So maybe you could kind of give us a little bit of a background on what it means to be a construction lawyer, uh, board certified. Sure, so it, it, starting in, in the mid 2000s, uh, but I think 2005 would have been the first class uh, that, that, that they had this. Um, and, and actually even before that for other types of law, the, the Florida bar uh, has always had rules that says that you, you know, restrict who can advertise themselves as a specialist, because the idea is you don't want an attorney who is a jack of all trades, master of none, to hold him or herself out as an expert. It, you know, for example, in personal injury law, if they've handled one personal injury case in the last 10 years, you know, that, that's, that's basically a false advertising concern. So uh, it used to be the case that nobody could advertise themselves as a specialist, and then you know, the bar kind of, the, the members of the bar kind of pushed back against that and said, well, some of us actually do know what we're talking about and, and do have specialized experience and, and training and that there should be some way that we could, uh, you know, truthfully advertise that to the public. So the Florida bar uh, started providing for board certification. So they set up a committee, it, you know, whether it's, you know, personal injury law, whether it's business law, whether it's uh, construction, in my case, they set up a committee of, of attorneys who are experienced in this area, and they came up with a list of criteria, how many years you have to practice in the area, you know, they, they create an exam that you have to take that, that tests your knowledge in that area, and then, uh, and then they publish these criteria, and so you submit an application showing that you have the, the number of years of experience, uh, you, you uh, sit for the exam, which is given every year in May, except this year <laughs> for obvious reasons. And, uh, and if you uh, pass, there, there's a peer review component of that too, where you're required to provide a list of attorneys that who have worked with you, who can attest to your knowledge and experience and, and ethics and professionalism. And if you pass that review and if you pass the exam, then you become board certified. And uh, there are, the last I heard, you know, there was in excess of 80,000, let's say, attorneys in Florida. Maybe it may even be above 100,000 at this point. And of that number, there are a couple hundred at most who are board certified in construction law. So it's, it's a very tiny number of the overall bar that, that is board certified in construction. So yeah, that's, that's I think what it, board certified, you know, and that's probably a longer answer than, than you were looking for. <laughs> Well, that's fine. And, uh, you know, in Louisiana, I believe the only specialization uh, certification we have is in patent law, but uh, it would be nice. And I think it's especially the way the American uh, legal uh, law school system works. I think board certification is a great thing, but uh, that's another topic. We do oh, have another and, question. And, you, know, you have a lot of things out there, a lot of, lot of competing information. You have best lawyers, you know, super lawyers, you know, all these kinds of lists of lawyers. And I, you know, I, I, I find my, net, my name on those lists too. Uh, mm -hmm. But Truthfully, you know, those are of limited benefit or limited value right. to the customer, I think, because it doesn't really tell you anything other than that attorney knows a lot of other attorneys because right. you know, the, the secret to super lawyers or best lawyers is that, you know, it's, it's voted upon. So whoever gets the most votes gets on the list. So um, does that yeah. mean so a good lawyer? You know, I don't know. But uh, it's a, a cheerleading contest. But 
Uh, Patricia has a question for you uh, on, okay. on, on point. Uh, she says, can you lean for damage or missing equipment, rental equipment? Can you lean for uh, damage, missing or rental equipment? I, I, you know, the short answer is no. I mean, I, I actually litigated that in a case and the owner of the equipment, you know, included in their lien uh, repairs to their equipment. And, uh, you know, and, and let me just say this, that there's not a case that comes out and says that in so many words, but when you look at the statute, it's talking about your, you know, it's an improvement to real property. Well, if there's damage to your machine, that's not really, that's not a benefit to the owner of the property. That's a damage to your machine. So that's something that whether your customer who's renting the equipment pays for the insurance or whether you carry the insurance for your customer, that's really something that somebody's insurance ought to be paying for. That should not be part of a construction lien. That's a good question though, because that, that has come up. Okay, any other questions before we uh, continue? I think we're okay right now. If you want to continue, I'll let you know if anything sure. else comes up in a few minutes. And, and again, if you think any of any other questions, I we, we encourage questions, that's, uh, that's what we're here for. So let's move on then to the next uh, phase of this, which is what notices are required. Florida makes it very easy for people to comply because the rule is very simple. Uh, you're required to serve, if you're, not, if you're not somebody who has a direct contract with the owner, so if you're not the general contractor or if you're not somebody who sold materials or, or some other services directly to the owner, then you must serve a notice to owner. And the timing of that is, is when 45 days of when you first started furnishing labor services or materials to the property. That's it. If you serve it on the 46th day, you're out of luck. Uh, you, never, you never get the chance to serve that notice again. Once it's gone, it's, it's, it's gone forever. So uh, it's a very important deadline to follow. And, uh, and, and the one, one secret about the Florida lien law is, um, you know, technically speaking, uh, there's no, you know, once you have a contract for the, for the job, in theory, you could serve a notice to owner immediately. Now, would I recommend that? No. But there's no, there's no date in the statute that says it's too early to serve one, uh, but, but you can be too late. So uh, the, the, as soon as that you can, uh, the, you know, the moment you mobilize that crew to the job, you know, your accounts receivable department ought to be preparing and serving that notice to owner. So how do you do that? Well, in Florida, they have something called a notice of commencement that is recorded in the public records, uh, usually by the contractor, must be signed by the owner, and it lists the owner's name and address, the contractor's name and address. If there's a lender, it lists the lender's name and address. If it's a bonded project, it'll list the surety's name and address. And that's a whole other discussion about filing bond claims. But by the way, the notice requirement is, is basically the same, uh, except that you're sending the notice to the contractor instead of the owner. Uh, but, uh, but all that pertinent information is on the notice of commencement. That is the gold standard. That is what you want. Now, some people are busy. They don't have time to go to, the, you know, you can, most, most uh, counties in Florida, you can pull up the notice of commencement online on the clerk of courts website on their, uh, because they list their, their public records on their website. You can pull them up that way. Some people are busy. They don't have time to do that. So you have companies like Level Set who will do that for you. But that's the information that you need to get in order to send that notice to the correct place. If you send the notice to the address listed for the owner on that notice of commencement and the owner signs it, it doesn't matter if the address is incorrect, you are covered because you did everything that was asked of you. And if the owner screwed up and put the wrong address on, that falls on the owner, it doesn't fall on you. So it, that's why that's a very important document. Now, one thing I have seen in my practice of material suppliers, there are many tiers down and many times they're supplying mat uh, material to a sub subcontractor or maybe a subcontractor. They don't, they don't the, the customer, their customer doesn't necessarily know who the general contractor is or doesn't necessarily know you know, the, the name of the project or the owner, because some of these projects are huge. You know, they just know that somebody called them up and wanted some rock, for example. Um, so, so if you, if you are, if you find yourself in that position, I strongly encourage you, if you're going to protect your lien rights to, to get that information, push your customer for it, because your customer needs to ask the question up the chain. You know, they need to ask their customer, you know, to get, get a copy of that notice of commencement uh, so that you have the information you need to protect your lien rights. So, uh, that's that's my little plug for uh, material suppliers. Um, so that's the only notice requirement under Florida law before you file your lien. Uh, assuming that you've served your notice to owner properly, uh, you then have 90 days after your final furnishing, that means the last date you were on the job, to record your lien. 
Now that doesn't include punch list work, that doesn't include warranty work. This is the last actual work that you're doing to complete the project. And uh, to use a, a legal buzzword, uh, it's basically substantial completion is, is effectively when uh, that clock starts running on your 90 day uh, uh, to file your claim of lien. So again, without uh, rushing too far ahead, let me open it back up for, uh, for any further questions. Yeah, Reese, that was good timing. Uh, Chris is asking, uh, can you file a lien before the last day of furnishing? Or maybe it's finishing? So, uh, well, yes, you can, because what, cause sometimes what happens is, um, you know, you're not getting paid. You know, you're, you're uh, a third of the way through the job and you're, you haven't received the first payment. You know, you still have two more, three more months uh, worth of work to do, but you, but you're, you're owed money now. So yeah, you can file that lien at any time while you're working on the project. Um, now, you know, you, you kind of, you run into some practical considerations. If you file a lien in the middle of the project, you, you might make somebody mad, but maybe you need to do it. Maybe, maybe you need to, and that's a good time to consult with your attorney and see, you know, uh, what the right strategy would be to try to, to get yourself paid. But legally, yes, you can file it any time before or you know, while you're working, and then within 90 days after your last work on the project. And uh, Patty asked, does the 90 days apply when, con when contracted directly with the owner? Yes. That's the shortest answer for me you'll ever get. There you go. We'll, <laughs> we'll let you move on, but great answer. Okay. Thank you. And All right. So now we get to the process for filing a lien. And uh, there's basically two requirements. You have to prepare and sign the lien, and then you have to record it. So the first part is you have to prepare to claim the lien in the statutory form. And if you don't know what that is, uh, you know, call level set, call an attorney. Uh, you know, people who are in the habit of doing this have the forms and can get those to you. Um, and, uh, but it's important to use the, the statutory form. Uh, you fill it out. You know, your name, the customer's name, the owner's name, the legal, legal description of the project. And by the way, all that information, again, is on the notice of commencement. So not only do you use that notice of commencement for your notice to owner, you also use it for uh, filling out the information on the claim of lien form. So uh, with that information, you'll, you'll fill that out. And then uh, to record a lien on somebody's property, under Florida law, you are re required to swear to the truth of what you put in your lien because you're putting a lien on somebody's property and if that lien is false, it's a slander of title. So under Florida law, you have to swear to the truth that you, you did in fact do that work and you are in fact owed this money. And so to, to have something uh, sworn to, it has to be notarized. Well, with a lot of offices closed, how uh, do you get something notarized with the, you know, in the current situation with COVID-19? You know, a lot of attorney's offices are, are closed or working with skeleton crews. A lot of banks are closed that, where you would get to uh, find a notary typically uh, maybe your employees are working from home and they're not immediately available, with, you know, because some people have notaries on staff, but, but maybe they're working from home. So, you know, how do you get something notarized uh, under our, our state, you know, safer at home procedures? Well, uh, we'll get to that in, in just a minute. That's the next slide. Um, the second process, part of the process is recording the claim of lien in the public records. Now, for most counties, um, in Florida, the clerk of the circuit court is the, also the, what's referred to as the county recorder. That's the uh, office that maintains the uh, public records. And if you wanted to go inspect the public records, you'd go to the courthouse, you'd find the clerk's office in the courthouse, uh, you'd find the recording department, and you'd ask to see the, uh, you know, the official records. And, and, and you could pull out the books and actually look at the documents that are recorded, uh, at least back when we used to record them in, in actual books. Uh, there's two exceptions that I'm aware of. Orange County, it's a different office. It's the controller. In Broward County, it's uh, there's an actual separate office. That's the county recorder's office. So you can Google that and find it online. Uh, but those, those are the two processes. So let's talk about these obstacles and how you overcome them, uh, given the COVID-19 situation. So how do you get, how do you get something notarized uh, given COVID-19? Well, it's effective January 1st, uh, coincidentally, in Florida, they have approved something called uh, remote online notarization. And what this is, is that you can get on a Zoom call basically with a notary, uh, just like we're doing for this webinar. And uh, you don't have to be physically present in, in the state of Florida. 
um, uh, you know, you just have to be able to connect through a video link with the notary. And uh, you have to obviously have to have a, a, a laptop or a PC that will run a, a, a browser that, that, that the um, notary's system supports. And then you must have a U.S. state issued driver's license or ID card. And you have to be able to show that on the screen to your, um, to your uh, person notarizing your document. And then they can, uh, and there's software that allows them to remotely notarize your document. So um, not every notary is set up for this, but uh, again, you know, go to good old fashioned Google, look it up. There, there are plenty of vendors out there that provide the service. And, uh, you know, for a small fee, of course, they'll, they'll be happy to, to remotely notarize your document for you. So that's, that's an option that has only been in effect since January 1st and just in time for the COVID pandemic. Um, so that, that the timing on that is, uh, is fortuitous. Reese, we're getting a few yeah. other questions. So okay. before we get too loaded up, I'll, I'll stop you. We have one sure. from uh, Colleen. Uh, she's asking, can you still file a lien if the owner paid the mechanical contractor, but you haven't been paid? Okay, so I'm going to make an assumption that the mechanical contractor is the person's customer and that the mechanical contractor didn't pay downstream. I'm assuming that's the case. Well, yes, if your customer has been paid, but they haven't paid you, yes, you can still file your lien because uh, that's kind of the purpose. The point of a lien is that if you don't get paid by your customer, you know, your customer absconds with the money, pays somebody else instead, you know, whatever, uh, then you then you protect yourself by file, filing a lien. So the answer to that is yes. Okay, and one more, and this is kind of in between the last two topics, uh, as far as deadlines for uh, filing liens, uh, Wheeler asks if there's any exceptions because of COVID-19. No, there's not. And that's, that's what's really important. And, and you know, we'll get into how you work around it, but uh, under Florida law, the, the deadlines are very strict. They, 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 it, Florida law is, is forgiving for things like if you made a mistake on the lien, you know, in terms of somebody's name or address or, you know, uh, you, you know, something like that. Um, you know, that, that if, there's a, if there's a mistake on the claim of lien that doesn't uh, cause prejudice to the owner, then it's kind of a no harm, no foul situation. But the, the timing, the timing is strictly construed. So there are no exceptions, it's 90 days. And, um, you know, now, where it can become a little bit unclear is uh, what was the last day of, of furnishing. You know, there, there can be some dispute about that because, you know, what uh, the owner may characterize as punchless, you might say, oh no, that was change order work, you know, so that was additional substantive work that I was doing to complete my contract. And so you can have a fact dispute as to what was that last day that started the 90 day clock. But as long as everybody understands or agrees on what starts the 90 day clock, then it's a, then it's a fixed 90 day period. Okay, and one more. I have an NOC filed with the courthouse. How long to file a lien on the property? Okay, uh, I'm not sure what they mean by an NOC. That's usually an abbreviation for a notice of commencement. Um, the Maybe Anne can Anne clear that up for us and we'll come back to it. Uh, she okay, yeah, to, she, she can provide a little more clarification as to what she means by an NOC. Uh, then I'm happy to be happy to address that. So, all right, so let's move on then to the COVID-19 challenge, clerk's office closures. So through a series of orders, the Florida Supreme Court beginning in March started canceling jury trials. Uh, at first it was through March, then it's through April. Now they've all been canceled through the end of May. Uh, result of that, the uh, chief judges of the various circuits in, in Florida, there's um, uh, 15 judicial circuits or something like that, uh, they started entering orders closing the courthouses. And so, for example, in Duval County, uh, if you want to record something at the clerk of court's recording department, you have to clear a COVID-19 screening process. And assuming you have your temperature checked and you check out okay, you can go into the courthouse, go straight to room 1046 and drop your documents into a Dropbox. And the clerk of court will record that uh, in, in due course, uh, along with everything they get in the mail and otherwise. Uh, if you're in Orange County or your lien, if your project is in Orange County, you need to file your lien in Orange County. Uh, the official uh, records recording office is closed. Uh, so you don't have the option of going into the office and their webpage directs you to the e-recording department, uh, which requires the use of an e-recording vendor. So much like you have vendors who do um, 
the remote online notarization, you have vendors who provide uh, e-recording services. And again, you have to uh, have a subscription or a license with them and pay them for their service. And then they will e-record your documents for you. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Uh, the Miami-Dade Clerk of Court, again, they, they have limited, uh, their office is closed and you can only e-record. Uh, the Broward County Recorder, uh, again, it's only through e-recording or by mail. And that's the address that they tell you to address the mail to. And, uh, and then as an exception to all, all, all the above, and I didn't, by the way, check all 67 counties in, in uh, Florida to see what their policies were, but uh, you're certainly welcome to check if you have a different county. But uh, Hillsborough, for whatever reason, the clerk's office is still open from nine to four. So uh, maybe they have some secret vaccine for uh, COVID that the rest of us don't have. I'm, I'm not sure what that's about, but, uh, uh, but if, you're, if you're leans in, in Hillsborough County, you can go, go, uh, go record it in person still. So uh, uh, Reese, I just want to yeah. let you know, uh, Anne had cleared that up a little bit. She says, yes, I'm um, talking about the notice of commencement. Are you saying the notice of commencement has to be filed within 90 days of completion or I have to lean on the property in 90 days for non-payment? So the notice of commencement is reported at the very beginning of the project. And that's typically, it has to be signed by the owner, typically is reported by the contractor. Uh, what has to be filed in 90 days after the end of the project is the claim of lien itself. It's a document called claim of lien and uh, has to be filled out. That's the document that has to be filed within 90 days of the end of the project or, the, or your last date of work. So, so that's, that's what I'm referring to as far as the 90 day deadline. So, um, so let's talk about e-recording. It sounds great, right? You know, you get online, you find somebody through Google, you pay your subscription fee, you send them their document, they e-record it. Well, that isn't exactly what it sounds like. What it means is that instead of putting something into the mail to the clerk's office, you're basically, you're, you're in effect emailing it to the clerk's office. It's not sent through email, but it's, the net effect is the same because it does not automatically, your document is not automatically recorded electronically. That's not how it works. Instead, the uh, clerk's office receives your document electronically through the, the software, uh, but the clerk's office employee, it still gets printed out, put in a stack, and the clerk's office employee still has to physically record that document, just like any other document that they're getting in the mail, getting in through FedEx, or getting in through a Dropbox that's left out in the hallway for people to use during COVID-19. So that doesn't guarantee you that your liens be recorded timely. So let's say, for example, you send your lien, you know, you're at day 88, and you send that lien by FedEx to the clerk's office, it arrives, you send it over, you know, overnight, you know, priority overnight, gets to the clerk's office, on the 89th day, and you must figure, all right, I got it there on day 89, I'm good. Well, not necessarily, because what happens with these clerk's offices is that they get it on day 89, but they already have 500 things to record ahead of your document. So they, they some of these counties run six, seven days behind on their recording. So even if you get it there on day 89, it may not be recorded till day 97. So just because you physically get it to the clerk's office doesn't mean it's recorded that day. And so that's the problem with e-recording is you're in the same boat as if you mailed it in or as, as if you FedExed it in. So that, you know, that, that's a very serious problem. Uh, so in, in same thing with mail, uh, you know, you send it in by mail, maybe it gets there on time. You know, first of all, it might get lost in the mail. If it doesn't get lost in the mail, it's still sitting in a stack with everything else. So, um, you know, that's a very serious problem. And again, there, there's no do-overs, there's, no, uh, there's no forgiveness for not recording by the 90th day. It's an it's a absolute fixed deadline. So, um, so let's talk about, well, let me stop there. Are there any uh, other questions before I continue? One of the questions we did have was about something you had covered a moment ago, and I'm not sure if you know this, but uh, Michelle had asked, um, do you know any other states that are extending lien rights due to COVID? Is that something that's happening in other jurisdictions? So um, the chief judge in, in Georgia was entering some orders that were pretty broadly worded that were extending deadlines, including statute of limitations and everything else. Uh, I, I'll be very candid. I haven't studied that order in, in, in great detail. It's certainly possible. Uh, and so if you have a question about that, you know, I'd be happy to talk to somebody uh, and, and look into that, you know, more closely. But, uh, but it, definitely not the case in Florida. 
And, and we're at about the 30 minute point race. So you just take your time to wind down as, as, as much as you want. We still have a, a full audience here and then we'll take some more questions at the end, but sure. what, we're well, on we're your timetable. The, the good news is this, this is a fairly short seminar. Uh, it, this, this is designed just to, to talk about these, these unique issues. And then if we have any other questions, we're happy to, to, to address those. So, so what's the solution? What do you, what do you do to overcome this? So, um, if your clerk's office is still open, if you happen to be in Hillsborough County, your project's in Hillsborough County, that's where you need to file your lien, you know, put a strap on your N95 mask and go in and do five minute recording. That's, that's the way if you go in and physically present your document for recording. Virtually every clerk's office is, will, will allow you to do five minute recording. It means they record it while you wait. And that guarantees you that it will be recorded on time, assuming you're there within the 90 days. The next best thing, of course, you can do the Dropbox, you know, that way you at least know it got to the courthouse. You didn't put it in the mail. You physically drove it and put it in the box. So you know the clerk has it. So that's the next best thing. You can do e-recording. And of course, you're going to need somebody with the software, probably a law firm, perhaps another vendor to upload your document. Or as a last resort, you can use FedEx or UPS. I do not recommend the mail for, for reasons that are obvious that we've talked about. But regardless of which method you use other than the five minute recording, if you put it in the Dropbox, if you e-record, if you FedEx it in, uh, you must, you must, you must call and follow up, call the clerk's office, ask them to pull your document out of the pile. Be polite, be, be appreciative, be, you know, smother them with kindness because they, they have the ability to make or break your lien. But we have found that, that if you ask nicely, they're more than happy pull your document out of the stack, especially if you explain to them that you're up against a deadline. So, you know, that, that's the best way is, you know, send it in and then follow up and, 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 and you know, send, the earlier the better. You know, if you can get it on, there on day 84, then, you, then you've got more margin for error. You know, don't wait till day 89, but, you know, send it in as soon as you can and then ask the, you know, call the clerk and ask for the recording department and ask one of the ladies there to, to pull your document out and, and make sure it gets recorded and tell them, you know, I, it has to be recorded by Friday. You know, tell them that. And, uh, and usually they're more than happy to help. So um, that's really it. Um, any further uh, questions? Well, I think uh, we had one question, um, but I think you answered it, Chris. It was basically just what if that particular uh, county doesn't have e-filing? And I think you answered some of the options there uh, that right. someone can do. Um, but other than that, uh, if you want to expand on that, I think you covered it, though. Yeah, again, you know, it's, uh, it's in-person recording or it's, uh, you know, you can FedEx it in basically and then again, call and follow up. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, the, the, we're still stuck with, uh, to some extent, 20th century technology in the 21st century. I think we'll probably eventually get to the point where you can electronically record documents. Uh, you, you know, the, the, when it comes to the circuit courts, the civil cases in Florida, we do uh, have electronic filing and you, you, you file a pleading in a lawsuit, for example, it's electronically filed. You, know, you, you no longer have to take things physically to the courthouse. And unless you're, you know, somebody pro se, you don't have it, unless you don't have an attorney and you're representing yourself, uh, the, the clerk's offices don't accept uh, physical documents anymore. So, uh, so I think we're going to get there with, uh, you know, official documents, official recording documents as well. We're just not there yet. Well, Reese, uh, I don't think we have any other questions here today, but I wanted to thank you so much. And again, this is Reese Henderson. Uh, he's a lawyer in Jacksonville, Florida, and he practices all over Florida. So he can answer any questions in Florida, as well as he uh, works somewhat in Georgia and is licensed there as well. Uh, so thank you so much, Reese. And I'll let you uh, end with some closing remarks and hopefully we can, uh, we can do this again sometime. And, and like I said, Reese is an excellent person to call or answer any questions in our, and he can help you answer questions in our expert center, but he's allowed to say because he's board certified that he is a specialist <laughs> in construction law, <laughs> that's, that's which is a right. no, no, so, which is a no, no, if you're not board certified. That, that, that's exactly right. So if you have any qu uh, follow up questions, uh, my, my contact information is available uh, on the level set website. It's also at our website. Uh, you can see on the screen is my email address, reese.henderson at gray-robinson.com. That's G-R-A-Y. And, um, you know, feel free to shoot me an email. And, uh, you know, I, I, I represent a lot of clients where all I do is at, typically, you know, that we do have the occasional lean, but uh, I'll get the occasional question. And it's just like, Reese, can you look at this uh, contract revision, Reese? Uh, you know, what what do I need to do to, to you know, or can you write me a letter on this? So, um, 
Yeah, I know. I know some folks are are you know concerned about you know they have a limited budget for for legal services, and you know we certainly do everything we can to uh, keep it affordable for folks. So, uh, if any if there any any way I can be of assistance, uh, don't hesitate to reach out. And uh, Seth, I, I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks very much. All right. Thanks again. Everyone have a great day and stay safe. <laughs>